Hey, what's up YouTube? In this video, I'm going to introduce systems of linear equations. So first, let's look at a definition of a linear equation. A linear equation in the n variables x sub 1, x sub 2, up to x sub n is an equation that can be written so that the sum of the n variables multiplied by the n coefficients, where the coefficients are a sub 1 up to a sub n. So we have that the sum is equal to some scalar b. Now here we have that the coefficients a sub 1 to a sub n and the scalar b are real numbers, or sometimes you might see a linear equation where these coefficients and the scalars are complex numbers. But for the most part, we're going to restrict ourselves to the real numbers. So for example, this equation is a linear equation. The coefficient a sub 1 is equal to 3, and then the second coefficient, which in this notation was a sub 2, is equal to 4, and then the, the 7 here is what b is representing in this notation. Here's another example of a linear equation. So this is just so you can get the idea of what they would look like. Now we're actually going to introduce something called a system of linear equations because often we want to look at more than just one linear equation. We usually want to look at a couple different linear equations and then see if there's a solution that solves every linear equation in the system. So a system of linear equations is a collection of one or more linear equations in the same variables x sub 1 up to x sub n. So here's an example of a system. This has two equations, and this is in the variables x sub 1, x sub 2, and x sub 3. So there's three variables in this system and two linear equations. This is another example of a system of linear equations. This has four linear equations in three variables, the variables being x sub 1, x sub 2, and x sub 3. Notice that this equation doesn't have an x sub 3 term, and that's okay. What that means is that we just assume that the a sub 3, the coefficient for the x sub 3 term, we assume that it's zero. So we're assuming that the coefficient for the third term is zero. Similarly, on this last one, we see that there's no x sub 2 term, so we're just assuming that the second coefficient in this equation is also 0. Finally, here's another example of a system of linear equations. This has two linear equations in two unknown variables, the x sub 1 and x sub 2. Now we're going to talk about finding solutions for systems of linear equations. So a solution of the system is an n-tuple with elements s sub 1 up to s sub n that makes each equation of the system true when x sub 1, x sub 2 up to x sub n is replaced by s sub 1, s sub 2 up to s sub n. So this means we have some n-tuple which contains real numbers that when we put that in, if we were to have some linear equation and we replaced x sub 1 with s sub 1, x sub 2 we put in s sub 2 instead, x sub n we put in s sub n, if we were to do that for each linear equation in the system, the linear equation would be true, so it would equal b. So let's look at an example. So we have a linear system of two equations in three unknown variables, the unknown variables being x sub 1, x sub 2, x sub 3. So any solution of this system is going to have to be a three-tuple because we have three unknown variables, and it's going to have to make both equations true when we plug in those three elements of the solution into our equations for x sub 1, x sub 2, and x sub 3, respectively. We have that 1, 1, 1, this 3-tuple, is a solution of the system. And that's because if we put a 1 in here for x sub 1, a 1 in here for x sub 2, and a 1 in here for x sub 3, we would get 1 plus 3 minus 5, that is equal to negative 1. So it's a solution of the first equation. For the second equation, if we plug in 1, 1, and 1, we get 2 minus 7 plus 1, and that is equal to negative 4, so it satisfies the second equation. So this list of three numbers, 1, 1, and 1, is a solution of this system of linear equations. Now that's not the only solution to this system of linear equations. For example, this three-tuple here is also a solution, because if we plug it in, for the first equation, we would get 45 divided by 13 plus 3 times 24 over 13 minus 5 times 2. And if you were to add these all up, you would see that it equals negative 1. So the first equation is satisfied. If you do the same for the second equation, we get 2 times 45 divided by 13 minus 7 times 24 divided by 13 plus 2. And if you add these all up, you'll get that this equals negative 4. And so that the second equation is true. So this 
is in fact a solution to our system of linear equations here. In fact, this system actually has infinitely many solutions. So as you can see from this example, just because a system has a solution doesn't mean that that solution is the only solution. This is why we usually talk about the solution set of a system of linear equations instead of just looking at a solution of linear equations. So we're going to define now a solution set. The solution set for a system of linear equations is the set of all possible solutions. Let's look at some simple examples of systems of linear equations now and see if we can find the solution set. So our first example will be the system of linear equations. It has two linear equations and two unknown variables. The first equation is given by x sub 1 minus 2 x sub 2 is equal to 1. And the second equation is negative x sub 1 plus 3 x sub 2 is equal to negative 1. Now we're going to graph these equations on the x sub 1, x sub 2 plane. The first equation is represented by this blue line here called EQ1 for equation 1. And what that tells us is that any solution of this first equation will lie on this blue line. So any pair of numbers that lies on this line will satisfy the first equation. And any pair of numbers that doesn't lie on this line, so if it was a number over here or some number here, that won't satisfy this first equation. So again, the only possible solutions for the first equation are points that are on this line. Now we can graph the second equation, represented by EQ2, and it's this green line here. So again, the only solutions for the second equation are going to lie on this green line. So if we want a solution for both equations, because we want a solution for the system, that means that it has to be a solution for the first equation and the second equation. So it has to lie on this line and on this line. Well, there's only one point that lies on both of these lines, and it's the single point, 5 comma 2. So that means that our solution set is the single element set with the point 5 comma 2. So there's exactly one solution for this linear system of equations. The next example I have is this system in two unknowns with two linear equations. The first equation is 2x sub 1 minus 3x sub 2 is equal to negative 1. And the second equation is negative 2x sub 1 plus 3x sub 2 is equal to negative 4. Now if we graph these again, we get the first equation is represented by this line here. The second equation is represented by this line here. And we can see that these lines are parallel, meaning that they're never going to intersect. So any solution of the first equation must lie on this line, and any solution of the second equation must lie on this line, which means that there is no common solution for both equations. So the solution set is the empty set, and there is no solution for this system of linear equations. Now the last problem I have has these two linear equations and two unknowns. The first equation is given by x sub 1 minus 2x sub 2 equals to negative 1. And the second equation is negative 2x sub 1 plus 4x sub 2 is equal to 2. If we graph these ones, what we get is that they're actually the same line. So the first equation is represented by this blue line here. And the second equation is the same line so that every solution to the first equation is also a solution to the second equation. The solution set then is just this entire line. So the solution set is all the pairs x sub 1 comma x sub 2 such that x sub 1 minus 2x sub 2 is equal to 1. Equivalently you could have said all the pairs such that negative 2x sub 1 plus 4x sub 2 is equal to 2. Um, I just put the first equation here but you could have put the second. It's the same idea. So this one has infinitely many solutions. To summarize, our first system had exactly one solution, our next system had no solutions, and then the third system had infinitely many solutions. And in fact, any time we're working with two variables, x sub 1 and x sub 2, we can see that it must have either exactly one solution, no solution, or infinitely many solutions. Because when we're working with two variables, these are just represented by lines. And we can't have a line intersecting at two distinct points, but not infinitely many because that would mean that the line would have to bend in order to meet another line in two points. So when we're working with only two variables, we can only have exactly one solution, no solution, or infinitely many solutions, which is pretty clear from the pictures. But in fact, this is true for all systems of linear equations, not just in two variables. So we have a theorem that says that a system of linear equations has one, no solution, two exactly one solution, or three infinitely many solutions. 
and I'm going to go through a proof of this, but feel free to skip the proof. So suppose that S is an arbitrary system of m linear equations in n variables x sub 1 to x sub n, and it's represented by these m linear equations. Now if S has no solution, then 1 is satisfied, and if S has exactly one solution, then 2 is satisfied. So we're going to assume that S has at least two distinct solutions, where we have the first solution being given here and the second solution here. And what we're going to do is we're going to show that since it has at least two distinct solutions, that it must have infinitely many solutions. So first notice that the average of the two solutions, given by this tuple here, is also a solution. So think about that for a second, why that would work. Essentially what we need to show is if we plug this element in for x sub 1, if we plug the second element in here for x sub 2, and then all the way up to the nth element, so this element here for x sub n, we want to show that every equation in this system S will be true. So, so to do that we're going to just look at the ith equation for an arbitrary i. So for any i from 1 to m, we're going to plug in this n tuple on the left side of the ith equation, and then what we get when we factor out the 1 half and rewrite it, we have 1 half times this sum here plus 1 half times this sum here. Now since y sub 1 to y sub n and v sub 1 to v sub n are both solutions, when these are plugged into every single equation in the system, each equation is true. Now notice here that this is the left-hand side of the ith equation, where y1 up to yn is plugged in, and then this part here is also the left-hand side of the ith equation, where v1 up to vn is plugged in. Since they're solutions, we know that this part will be equal to b sub i, and similarly this part will be equal to b sub i. So we get that this is equal to 1 half b sub i plus 1 half b sub i, which of course is equal to b sub i. So therefore we have that the ith equation, which looks like this, is true when x sub 1 up to x sub n is replaced by this n tuple here. So we've shown that there's three solutions now, but we can actually take it further and say that for any scalar c, if we take c times y sub 1 plus 1 minus c times v sub 1, and then do that for every single term, so up to the nth term we have c y sub n plus 1 minus c v sub n, we'll get that this new n tuple is a solution to the system for every scalar c. So since there's infinitely many scalars, if we can show that this is a solution for every scalar c, we'll show that the system has infinitely many solutions. So to do that, we'll use the same technique as before. We're going to say for each i from 1 to m, we have that the left-hand side of the ith equation with these elements plugged in gives us this equation, and then that equals c times this sum plus 1 minus c times this sum, and we got that by taking out all the y terms and getting them together, and then all the v terms and summing those together. Now again, since the y sub 1 up to y sub n is a solution of this system, it must be a solution of the ith equation, so this must equal b sub i, and then here, since v sub 1 to v sub n is a solution of the equation, of the ith equation, this will also equal b sub i. So we're going to get that this equals c times b sub i plus 1 minus c times b sub i. Then if we distribute this out, we'll see that this is just equal to b sub i. And so we conclude that the system must have infinitely many solutions. And that completes the proof. Now, we say that a system is consistent if it has at least one solution. That is, if it has either exactly one solution or infinitely many solutions. And then we say a system is inconsistent if it has no solution. So back to our examples, the first system of linear equation here that we worked with, it had exactly one solution, so this system was consistent. The second system of linear equations had no solution, so it was inconsistent. And then the third had infinitely many solutions, so this one is consistent. That's all we're going to cover in this video. See you next time. Thanks for watching.